Hello, I'm Scott Marcus, the Senior Content Manager with the International Screenwriters Association. I needed a little bit more information on three subgenres of movies and storytelling that I really don't know much about. And I thought you might find that interesting too. In this short conversation, presented in three parts, I'll be talking with Jeffrey Morales of the ISA about anime movies, video game movies, and comic book movies. Enjoy. Let's start with the thing that I'm least familiar with, and that is anime, anime movies. And I'm not alone in this one when it comes to box office prognosticators, because just a few weeks ago, a movie came out of, well, as far as we were concerned, came out of nowhere. Uh, a lot of places, like even Box Office Mojo didn't have it on its list of upcoming releases, and that was Jujitsu Kaisen Zero, which on the third weekend of the Batman's release, when nobody else was trying to compete against it, this movie came out and performed really well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Did you even know it was coming? I'm guessing maybe. And what even is it? Well, I haven't watched or read Jujutsu Kaisen, but I know about a good bit about it. And the reason why I know about it is because of where it did come from. So you've probably heard of anime maybe called Naruto or One Piece. I'm pretty sure you've heard of Dragon Ball. The thing about a lot of those shows is they actually all come from the same publisher. It's kind of like saying, well, we didn't know that there was going to be Guardians of the Galaxy, but we knew that there was Marvel, even though there isn't an established continuity there. In the case of Marvel, there is, but not with Jujutsu Kaisen. So just to give you kind of a, uh, an understanding of where anime comes from, most anime is the product of an adaptation. It's either derived from a manga, which is a Japanese comic book, or it's from what's called a light novel. And when they say light novel, um, if you're not familiar, uh, and I just happen to have this, uh, here, I did not plan this um, because I'm trying to balance a million things on boxes. Uh, you have these things called kanji. And uh, there's thousands of them. And if you're trying to learn Japanese, you have to start learning the individual kanji and how to read them and things like that. And so in light novels, they go, okay, we're only going to use so many complicated kanji because we want children and teens to read it. So that's where a lot of anime comes from. And it's a very standardized and understood process in Japan, sort of kind of, if you remember the heyday of uh, adapting books and young adult novels around a sure. decade ago, and it was almost like we just had, okay, get the book out, get the movie out. Imagine that going on for decades. Hmm. And imagine there being one single magazine that is a collection of comic books that comes out every week. And it has the biggest manga series in Japan. And that's called Weekly Shonen Jump. Okay. And so back in the uh, late 80s and the 90s, Weekly Shonen Jump produced Dragon Ball. And it was an anthology book, and it still is an anthology thing. And so Dragon Ball would come out, made a ton of money, got a lot of eyes on it, series, shows, video games. Uh, and then it ended, and several shows filled its gap. One Piece, Bleach, Naruto. Again, in that same publication, I hmm. believe all of those are Shonen Jump shows. So, so they're basically, that's the marvel of this genre. Exactly. And you can okay. kind of... Imagine if Marvel, but there was no continuity between them. Okay. So, so they're just entirely independent. And they're actually, what's even more remarkable is Dragon Ball is thousands of pages long. Hmm. And I've read the whole thing because again, the nerd to the right here. And it's also uh, written and drawn by one guy. <laughs> it's the whole Ooh. thing. <laughs> That's how they do comics in Japan. It's all in black and white. And you just have one guy, he writes it and he draws it. And Bill, the guy who does Dragon Ball, he was a millionaire before he started Dragon Ball because he already had a hit comedy uh, comic oh, wow. book. <laughs> but people would look at his workplace and it's just nothing but cigarettes and like energy <laughs> drinks. And it's just on the, and he was like working on the floor. And it's, that's just how you work for 10 years when you have these hit series. And then people like me are like, why are you retiring? Why don't you make Dragon Ball for another 10 years? Yeah. I like reading it. So... Uh, you, you have these very creator-driven projects. So there's one guy who does one piece. And yeah, he has a team to finish the art and stuff like that, but it's that guy. There's the guy who does Dragon Ball and there's the person who does Jujutsu Kaisen. And Jujutsu Kaisen is one of the newer Shonen Jump projects, relatively speaking. Dragon Ball has been over for years. One Piece is still going on, but it's, I mean, it's older than some of our viewers. Let me put it that way. Okay. And so... Being told that there was a new Jujutsu, a new Shonen Jump project wasn't really shocking. A perfect storm had been brewing, and I didn't okay. know that it was brewing, hmm. which is what's the hardest part about getting into an anime series other than everything? 
<laughs> well, most of it's serialized. Okay. And yeah. they go on for a long time. As I said, Dragon Ball is thousands of pages long. But if I told you, hey, there is one animated movie you could watch for Dragon Ball, no continuity to worry about. Every concept you need to know about is going to be introduced. It's going to be its own standalone arc with the main character. I'm sure you probably go, oh, well, that's going to be how I'm going to get into Dragon Ball. It might even be how you get into anime. Now, that doesn't work with Dragon Ball because of, it's a generational saga. But with Jujutsu Kaisen, Jujutsu Kaisen Zero, it's a prequel that was written before the main series. It's only a prequel in the anime medium. The guy had written Jujutsu Kaisen Zero initially, and then Jujutsu Kaisen, the main series came out, became a hit. And then they realized, wait a minute, we have this standalone story and we can make this hmm. into a movie and it can be a hit. And so it's one of those cases where once you understand where this stuff comes from, you understand the corporate structure that's supporting yeah. it, you understand the narrative components, then it's, you're just sort of sitting there going, well, of course, this is going to be a hit. Yeah, yeah. And so is that why there's a zero? Because it's like pre before part one? Exactly. It's a prequel before this. And it's a different protagonist as well. Do you think there's oh, a different protagonist? Interesting. Because I was going to ask if that was a, a method to open their audience to make it then, you know, actual future Jujutsu Kaisen's more accessible movie going kind audience, of right. Movies in general, especially anime movies, are handled very differently mm. in anime than they are in the United States. So we can kind of use a, an example of the Simpsons movie. Sure. And we have, I know we have Bob's Burger coming up and we might chat about that. I think it's a tall order to say to somebody, hey, do you want to watch that Simpsons movie and you've never seen anything about the Simpsons ever? Mm -hmm. I think it would also be a little alienating if you said, hey, we're going to make um, a Simpsons movie and it's going to take place in a different version of Springfield. And it, without actually, the main it's characters, in, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same characters, but uh, Homer yeah. will have hair in this one um, because we've completely redone his design and, and it's just a completely mm. new continuity. Uh, that's not going to fly. In, yeah, in, yeah. In, whereas in uh, Japan, what they would often do is they would make what were called non serial movies. And this gets a, back to that environment that you need to understand where the, a lot of these stories come from. In Japan, with anime, you have uh, adaptations that go on for years like Dragon Ball was about a seven year run. And it's a locked continuity. If you're not familiar with Dragon Ball, and I like to use Dragon Ball because again, I watched a lot, yeah. <laughs> is it involves a, uh, a, a little monkey boy who grows and fights one fight after the next, becomes the strongest person on the planet, goes into space, starts fighting aliens, then starts fighting people from the future. Then he starts fighting people from space, uh, from the future or no the from the distant past that are also magical it's it's a lot and it just keeps yeah, getting yeah, bigger and bigger yeah. until the show ends and the guy dies he comes back he has kids he winds up the grandfather at the end of the show <laughs> and it's just each conflict has significant fallout so you can't just put in a story there that anybody can watch yeah. and a lot of anime is like that it's page turning it's cliffhangers at the end of chapters and so if you're trying to make a movie out of this, to maybe make a little bit of money and expand it to a new market, what do you do? Well, you say, all right, it's not in continuity. <laughs> Goku yeah. is over here and he's fighting with this guy and his best buddy's over here, even though his best buddy died a year ago. You're just here to watch the show and enjoy it. Um, hmm. So there is this natural history and, and tendency to make these non-serialized movies which also means that when they do have that opportunity to say, oh, wait a minute, we have a standalone story and we don't need to make a show out of it. Let's make that movie now because that is, again, that perfect storm. And, and before we move on from talking about anime, I, I did have to just mention that this was so surprising to me and I'm going to guess it's surprising to a lot of our viewers. If you were to think that a movie would come out in April of 2020, that was at the height of the beginning of the pandemic, when the world was shut down, that sounds like, whoa, that movie is going to be doomed. Uh, and of course, that movie went on to be the highest grossing movie of the year. And it was an anime movie. And I was completely unaware of it. It still did good domestic uh, business here. 90 or forty nine and a half million dollars. Not too shabby. Internationally, it did four hundred and fifty three million dollars. And that is Demon Slayer. Uh, that very, very strong performance out of a movie that I don't think I even heard of until recently. So it very quietly, at least to, you know, mainstream American viewers like myself, 
miss it entirely, but that is a, a franchise as well. That's There's been a couple of Demon Slayer releases. So Demon Slayer is uh, another good example, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that's also Shonen, not Shonen Jump. And you probably are wondering what the heck Shonen is. Okay. Yes. Shonen, <laughs> shonen means boy. Okay. And the way that manga does its uh, demographics in Japan is they group it into about five categories. You have uh, very young kids, and then you have shonen, which is boy, uh, shoujo, which is girl, uh, jose, which is young woman, and sign-in, which is young man. And they have these big magazines like Shonen Jump, and they'll be released weekly with several stories within them, all targeted at one particular demographic. So uh, shonen is where we get a lot of our adaptations uh, in the United States. We, we tend to favor that shonen demographic, in particular because sign-in projects get a little violent, they get a little mm -hmm. sexualized. Um, and shonen itself, especially some of the older works, got away with stuff which we would never get away with in the United States. So we would go, oh, well, this is like in Japan aimed at nine-year-olds. Let's, let's bump it up because it's got a periphery demographic in the States. And that is uh, Demon Slayer in a nutshell because Demon Slayer in Japan is very much for boys. It's got uh, a story about gaining special powers through breathing to fight demons and it's set in sort of a fantastical feudal japan mm -hmm. um and it's beautifully drawn beautifully animated especially the movie uh but you bring that over to the states and you go wow a lot of these kids are dying um this is a <laughs> bit much that tells you why you have a hit anime series at least in terms of television but then what does that translate to when you go into a film mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about the complicated continuity because Demon Slayer's movie is a unique case where they had a story arc that was in continuity and they said, oh, wait, we can do this whole thing in a movie that's actually in continuity. It's not a non-serialized movie. A couple of things happened that helped Demon Slayer out. One of which was obviously it didn't have to go up against Marvel movies and it didn't have to go up against random successes that, that even caught me up by surprise, like the Joker and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is benefiting from the fact that anime is popular in China. And so uh, it was able to make quite a bit of money in China. It was able to make quite a bit of money in Japan because Japan's COVID uh, storm, as we shall call it, sure. happened in a different way. It's waves appeared at different times because their social distancing was different from ours. You know, we always want to give some lessons that maybe our uh, our membership of screenwriters can learn from or some inspiration. Uh, anime, as we're talking about, it sounds like a very closed off genre that somebody living in America that maybe isn't already part of the system, uh, it might be difficult to break into. What are your thoughts on if you wanted to be an anime writer? For one, do you have to be in Japan working within that system? Or can you do something that is maybe inspired by anime um, without seeming like cultural appropriation or something like that, where you can, you know, you have an honest love for the story. And we see that it is finding a bigger and bigger audience. Not that you want to write specifically to make money, but if you write anime, uh, there's a better chance than in the past to actually find an audience, which is a good thing too. Uh, what, what would you say to somebody in America or in London or somebody outside of Japan that wants to start getting into the world of writing anime? Well, when it comes to actually writing anime, that, that's a bit of a tall order. It's, um, yeah. Just because Japan is um, a very closed off country, uh, not just because of the pandemic. And, you know, it's a practical thing, just language barriers and, and narrative styles that take years to develop. Uh, but also there are certain tropes that they expect someone to understand intimately, certain social elements. Um, and so it, it's unlikely for someone to be able to really just go over to Japan, even if they're a great writer and say, well, can I just, can I get an episode here? <laughs> um, but what is rising is the, uh, the almost a subgenre of anime inspired works. You know, we've, we've actually been anime inspired for maybe 20 years across mm -hmm. animation, um, even sort of uh, the old DC comic cartoons had some anime influences simply because those people loved it. Getting into animation, it's almost an entirely different career path. Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly, but understanding anime can really help you simply because uh, there is this growing desire to imitate the narrative uh, approaches that they take into animation. Um, because frankly, they've been producing more stuff, especially stuff when we're talking that has a bit more of a dramatic potential, a bit more uh, of a mature audience. 
Um, and then even, even for kids stuff, we had Avatar The Last Airbender, and that was very much anime inspired. Even Disney is taking more cues uh, from some of the animation tricks that they use. So I, I would suggest really to start understanding anime just as a genre, um, not simply because it can help your writing, which it can in animation and outside of animation, but also because it's great. Uh, I, I would like to sign you up, Scott, for a whole video where I explain how to get into anime and the one show that you got to watch. People ask me, Jeff, how do you get into anime? And I go, well, I have a list of 20 different shows um, in different genres, but, but I can give you a one or two. And, and I'd like to subject you, Scott, at some point to, to watching some anime, uh, as someone who's never seen any of it, um, and just see, see uh, how long it goes until you tell me to stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will happily sign up to be your test subject. <laughs> Great.